Okay, we should be good. So uh, today, obviously, uh, our, the goal of the class is to have our first two presentations uh, on uh, their research into the Vietnam War. And um, I, I want to be completely upfront and say my, my, my goal is to be flexible here, to be lenient and kind and supportive. This is not easy. I know it was challenging to continue research, having to switch uh, to all online sources if you didn't have your physical books in hand. And so I, I understand that there's a lot of different ways that this could affect your preparation. And so, um, so just rest assured in that sense. And this is a friendly environment. It's designed so that we all get a chance to ask you maybe some questions at the end of your presentation. Uh, if we do, it'll be softballs. It'll be things that, you know, hopefully you have no problem answering. But uh, the goal is that, you know, this is your chance to share your research. And as I said before, your research paper, uh, you know, is of a certain length, uh, but your presentation doesn't have to necessarily cover everything that you've researched. Uh, it could be uh, an abbreviated version of that or some aspect of it, something you think is meaningful. And so um, hopefully as you present, you'll give uh, you know, to all of us listeners a sense of what your, what your subject is and, and what it is that you wanted to answer about it and some sense of an argument that you're making about it, or at least how it connects to the, the topic that you've chosen for today. So uh, first up will be Jack, uh, and Jack, if you'll go ahead and introduce your topic uh, and get started, that'd be great. Okay, so I'll start screen sharing. Sounds good. Okay, everybody can see it. So I'm Jack Rizzio, and I'll be doing a presentation on the strategic bombing campaign over Vietnam lasted from 1965 to 1960, sorry, 1973 is when it ended. But before we get to Vietnam, we have to cover the background. And the background for the bombing campaign in Vietnam certainly starts in World War II. American experience in World War II was shaped almost entirely by money. And I think this is one of the most important points to get. And if you can understand this, you can understand the American response to pretty much any problem, war or otherwise. In the context of World War II, money provided the best factories, made the best planes, and some of the best trained pilots. And even outside of, well, sorry, imme even immediately after the war, uh, our solution was to throw piles of money when the problem was Europe threatening to go communist. And then, Outside of money, um, one field which became popular in World War II was statistical analysis. And here we have the face of statistical analysis, although by no means was he the only person, Robert McNamara. And just for some real quick background on McNamara, he got his start in World War II studying the bombing campaigns over Japan. So it's pretty natural that his decisions and his opinions on the bombing campaigns over Vietnam would be heavily influenced by World War II. And finally, I want to emphasize this. Those who practiced statistical analysis won the conflict. It wasn't just us. The Soviets did it also, did it as well, quite a lot. Um, so these are the things that won us the war. And immediately after World War II, continuing the background, Nobody expected the next big war to be anything other than World War III. Uh, Inter-service rivalries post-World War II are very important to cover. The U.S. Air Force was 100% the, the golden boy, the most loved child of the American public and American politicians in the years immediately following World War II. The Air Force had priority for all the new stuff that was coming out, new radars, new planes, new whatever. And if they didn't have something, they could very easily get the funding for it. You can compare this with the Army, which was demobilized on a level similar to that of immediately after the Civil War. The Navy, which was having new ships canceled and existing ships sunk at an incredible rate. 
and the Marines who were very nearly shut down entirely. Like I said before, preparation for World War III was the overriding concern. Now, how would World War III be, how would World War III be fought according to the people of this time? Um, in later years, you'd hear about places like Fulda Gap in central Germany. Uh, this was before all that. If you went back to World War, sorry, if you went back to the early Cold War and asked somebody of this time what the next major war would look like, they would say bombers from both sides flying over the Arctic Circle. And if you look just to the right of this, you'll see the final scene from the excellent movie, Dr. Strangelove, which was heavily influenced by the politics of this time. And indeed, Dr. Strangelove was inspired by a great book called Red Alert, which again is all about nuclear bombers. <clears throat> so nuclear weapons also had, were by far the most important thing. Every weapon, that was made had to have some kind of nuclear capability to it. And just to illustrate this point, just below the black and white picture, you'll see a picture of a rocket. And this is the AIR-2 Genie, one of the most unusual weapons, in my opinion, to come out of the early 1950s. It was an unguided rocket meant for a fighter plane to shoot down a bomber, and it was nuclear tipped. So it was pretty much the closest thing to hip tossing a nuclear weapon. And it wasn't just limited to the Air Force, uh, the Navy, they were making nuclear torpedoes and the Army, they had uh, nuclear backpacks. And during all this talk of nuclear weapons, nobody had an idea what counterinsurgency was. So the Korean War obviously happened between World War II and Vietnam, but it was largely seen as an anomaly. Uh, it did prove that the Navy still needed some aircraft carriers and the Army and the Marines still needed to exist, but nobody at that time would have thought, well, the Korean War just happened, that's probably going to be what most of the next wars are going to look like. So Vietnam officially kicks off in American history in 1965, but of course we were involved there from a much earlier time. In 1965 also kicked off Operation Rolling Thunder, which was the first major bombing campaign the US had enacted since World War II. Uh, Rolling Thunder was based off a strategy of gradual escalation and had to balance a couple differing problems. Number one, Rolling Thunder's goal was to pressure North Vietnam to negotiate. In this strategy of gradual escalation, targets would be hit gradually across all of Vietnam especially the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which I'll get to in a little bit. And you can even see it in the name, Rolling Thunder. It's supposed to roll across Vietnam. And combined with the troop surge, which raised the number of American soldiers in Vietnam from 75,000 advisors to 200,000 combat troops, this was thought to be enough to ensure South Vietnamese survival. And in this, it survived. South Vietnam did not collapse when Rolling Thunder during Rolling Thunder. There were also the risks of involving China in the USSR. Johnson and McNamara figured, if we go too hard too quickly, we're gonna involve much more powerful players than North Vietnam. And certainly, Vietnam War is not worth going to thermonuclear war with the Soviet Union over. Johnson himself also had some domestic concerns. His big interest was the Great Society program, similar to the New Deal of 30 or 40 years ago. And also the civil rights movement was happening concurrently to the Vietnam War. So these domestic concerns meant that Johnson, he had a very limited political capital to spend and Rolling Thunder kind of took a backseat. So Rolling Thunder did see some limited success. North Vietnamese Army or NVA, which by the way is different from the Viet Cong or Viet Minh, North Vietnamese Army was a conventional military force with tanks and planes, whereas the Viet Cong were those guerrillas we were fighting. Anyway, the North Vietnamese Army could not hope to fight traditional battles. And according to Maoist counterinsurgency, which is what the communists were using, the guerrilla does not win unless he wins. The conflict was frozen for a time because of this. 
North Vietnam still had its ultimate goal of reuniting all of Vietnam under its own communist government, and South Vietnam was kept on life support. Rolling Thunder had a, a number of points of failure. Number one, it failed to stop the flow of supplies southwards. I mentioned before the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, it was the trail used by North Vietnam to move supplies like ammunition and food and whatnot to the guerrillas in South Vietnam. And it was not a highway like we might think of. It was a series of really small trails constantly moving through the jungle and trying to bomb such a target from 40,000 feet in the air was not a success, not a success story. Uh, furthermore, Johnston and McNamara had their so-called Tuesday lunches where before every Tuesday lunch, they would sit down with a map of Vietnam and select each target by hand. And this was not an efficient way of target selection because commanders on the ground with ever-changing needs didn't really have the luxury of waiting an entire week for their new targets to be updated or what have you. Soviet supplied North Vietnamese air defenses were top of the line. The Soviet Union absolutely had some of the best air defenses and even today, Russia still has incredibly good air defenses. That made it very difficult for American bombers to survive. And finally, the route package system. Uh, if you'll think back to those inter-service rivalries between the Air Force and other services, uh, they got to be a very big problem during this time. The Navy and the Air Force, who were jointly sharing bombing targets, had divided North Vietnam into route packages sorry, all of Vietnam into route packages, where an Air Force pilot would need the Navy's permission to bomb a Navy target and vice versa. Needless to say, permission was generally not granted and the end result was a much less efficient bombing campaign. The Rolling Thunder obviously ended in 1968, with it Johnson's presidency. The Tet Offensive happened in that same year and it consisted of simultaneous surprise attacks across South Vietnam. If you look to the map to the right of the screen, you'll see the Ho Chi Minh Trail snaking through Laos and Cambodia. Uh, and it went pretty much as far south as South Vietnam could go. The Tet Offensive was a tactical loss for North Vietnam in that they failed pretty much all of their objectives. However, it was also a strategic win because it was a disaster for Johnson's public relations. The military during this time had been telling the public that we were winning this war and there was not a whole lot to worry about. And suddenly when the Tet Offensive happens, the reporters like Walter Cronkite were talking about how North Vietnam, who was supposedly losing, were able to somehow attack targets with impunity throughout South Vietnam was not a good public relations program. Nixon inherited this war. Stalemate was not a political, politically acceptable to the US. Uh, frozen conflict is not something we like. So Nixon's strategy was called peace with honor. And another way of putting it is, let's figure out how we can get out of South Vietnam without looking like we are abandoning our allies. And one of the things Nixon did is he made overtures to China. And this was actually an extremely successful diplomatic trip. Uh, it could be called China's version of Glasnost to a degree. And that was aimed at cutting off the support to North Vietnam. North Vietnam, especially Hanoi, realized that if they waited too long and China and the US had good relations sometime soon, the North Vietnam would become like North Korea, uh, something China would rather ignore. So in response to this, in 1972, North Vietnam launched the Easter Offensive, which is not similar to the Tet Offensive. The Easter Offensive was actually a full-scale mechanized assault into South Vietnam by the North Vietnamese Army. Think of it much more like World War II than any sort of counterinsurgency program. In response to the Easter Offensive, the US very quickly organized Operation Linebacker One. Like Rolling Thunder, its job was to stop the flow of men and material southwards. Unlike Rolling Thunder, they were not bombing a tiny trail in the jungle, but massed troop formations and 
even literal highways in, in an attempt to stop all, this, all these supplies and weapons moving. Linebacker One took place at the same time as Nixon's Vietnamization, which saw decreases in the American troop numbers there. At the same time, it saw increases in the amount of American air involvement, or rather more intense bombing campaign than previously. Linebacker One saw technological change. This was the first time when guided weapons really became useful in war, such as laser guided bombs and missiles. And it also saw much more intense use of the famous B-52, pictured right, uh, which was by far one of the best bombers ever, best strategic bombers, I should say, ever invented. It was generally a strategic rethinking on part of the US. Linebacker One was much more aggressive and took advantage of Hanoi's primary mistake during this war, during this part of the war, which was to fight war the way the US fights war. The results of linebacker one were limited success because of limited goals. The limited goal was to stop the Easter offensive and this was successful. Linebacker one combined with the Chinese peace with the peace with China worked against North Vietnam. China being North Vietnam's military benefactors became less and less willing to support North Vietnam's war. Follow up on the success of linebacker one came linebacker two, which was the first time during the war when we were able to target Hanoi directly. Using these incredibly powerful B-52s, it was a massive and sustained bombing to pressure Hanoi to stay at the peace table. It originally was only supposed to last for three days. And when North Vietnam did not accede to our demands, which was to return to the peace table in those three days, we followed it up with eight more days of round the clock bombing by these uh, B-52s. And if you look to the picture on the right, this is not a picture of Hanoi, but a picture of a bombing raid in the jungle. And that smoke cloud in the distance, which looks to be miles away and extremely high, is what only one B-52 can do. Imagine six of them or 10 of them they'll produce devastation on a level similar to a nuclear weapon. So linebacker two actually forced North Vietnam back to the peace table. So linebacker two can be counted as a success. Of course, North Vietnam only stayed at the peace table until the United States left. And shortly after we did fully leave Vietnam, North Vietnam resumed its attacks against South Vietnam ending in 1975 with communist victory. The lessons of Vietnam. Political input, especially in bombing campaigns, are necessary, but they're necessary at the strategic level. To have those Tuesday lunches is, it was called the 8,000 mile long screwdriver at the time. Uh, it is an incredibly efficient misuse of resources. Can air power accomplish political objectives? If you look at linebacker one and two, yes, it can. However, we may have become too dependent on this, on air power as a tool of foreign policy. Air power very much has limits. And the answer to the question at the bottom, can technology buy a win? I think most people will agree the answer is no. But America is very averse to casualties and long protracted wars and technology sure can shorten these. Air power after Vietnam has only become more popular. It is politically expedient and it is much cheaper than deploying troops. For examples of wars that were fought without any combat soldier involvement, that is soldiers fighting on the ground, you can see, actually scratch that, first Gulf War was an example of troops fighting in the ground, but before the first Gulf War, there was a six week long bombing campaign which effectively neutralized the Iraqi military. Then Yugoslavia, the 2011 intervention in Libya, and the 2017 intervention in Syria all saw bombing campaigns without any sort of combat troop involvement. During this time, unmanned aerial vehicles or drones have also become very popular. They are extremely easy to fly even into other countries' airspace and present zero risk to Americans. And to wrap things up, a quick discussion question. Is this a good thing? There's one school of thought that says going to war should cost something to the average person. 
in no war since World War II have Americans been directly affected by the war. Maybe during the North Vietnam drafts, or sorry, during the Vietnam War drafts, but even in Vietnam, a majority of the people volunteered to be there. If you make war cost something to the average person, that might, might dissuade people from thinking too quickly about going to war. That being said, if you neuter your own ability to respond quickly and efficiently, that means you're not going to be able to respond when a crisis happens in a foreign, in a foreign land. And this calls into question how a superpower traditionally behaves. Or do they use their most expedient tools to respond to any crisis in the world? Well, I don't have the answer, and I suspect most people here don't, but I'd love to hear some debate. And with that, references, if any of you want it, and thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Jack. I sorry, I had mine on that uh, uh, mute there for a second. That was really excellent. Um, and I liked especially that at the end, uh, you have a question for us. And so I'm kind of curious if um, we can have other students uh, give their thoughts on that. Um, so I guess um, a question within a question. Um, Jack and to the as a response, but can you really win a conflict? Um, I mean, you can't win a war without boots on the ground, right? I mean, you can you can have all the air superiority you want, but without that, you know, ground support, you're you're nothing. Will yeah, you, that uh, is a good question. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, I mean, like. Of course, uh, an air campaign is is excellent. It's, you know, pre Gulf One, pre Gulf Two, um, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, A tens and drones and all sorts of things make you know pink mist out of funny people. But it's uh, it's um, you know you can only do so much. And and again, there's you say that you know with people like the Russians still have some of the best anti air um, in the world. So do you think? that their superiority is the the key factor or do you think that um i mean to answer your question in short to start that um i think air superiority is the the way to go um and the uh you know eyes in the sky are are the way to go whether it's intel whether it's attrition whether it's just you know presence um that's enough um, but again, a war can't be won without boots on the ground. And so that's where I'm kind of flipping the question to you is that, do you think that it is air power is the, the end all be all, um, when it comes to, do you think it's like a key factor or do you think it's more like it can be not subverse, but it can be supplemented with, you know, a capable ground force and, uh, you know, a capable, a capable ground force or clandestine operations. Um, do you think it's, it's, yeah. It seems yeah. like a pretty broad question. It's a good question. Um, I think it really depends on what kind of war you want to fight. Uh, most of our wars since World War II have been in support of other people. And to use air power for such a goal is, for example, supporting the, the Syrian Democratic Forces in Syria, I think that's worked out very well. Our targets have mostly been ISIS, something everybody can get behind bombing. Um, but to use a different kind of phrase in the same way, it's a lot easier to blow up trains than it is to build them and make them run on time. Um, air power is really low cost. It's really easy to sell for an American politician to uh, the American people, but it often does not buy the, the long-term benefits that you really want. And that also begs the question, what does buy those? And I think it takes a lot of development. 
like if your end goal is a liberal democracy in every nation in the world, then maybe every nation in the world has to go through what Europe went through to get those liberal democracies. And that's a lot of bloodshed. But maybe using air power to speed up these wars and end them quicker isn't the worst idea. Uh, that being said, if our goal has been to make liberal democracies in nations like Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, well, the success of these nations today might be a clue to how successful we were. I'm curious, uh, Nick and Olivia, uh, you hear the conversation that Robert and Jack are having, and I think there's two elements to it. I, um, without want to, without wanting to interject my own opinions at the moment, I would say that one part of their discussion is about the air power use in Vietnam, but then um, a lot of the more meaningful part of their discussion is about air power today. And so uh, I'm kind of curious if you have thoughts or questions your, of your own that uh, touch on either of these two aspects. I don't really think that bombing people will ever solve problems or make friends for any country, the, the bombing country. Um, and if we're using it to fight terrorism, which or communism, anything that requires you to um, not alienate an entire group of people, so really any war, um, I think that all you do is create the next generation of people who hate you um, and want to fight you when you use air power and just bomb. Well, maybe. Uh, yeah, you certainly have a point. We've given ourselves a lot of enemies through our drone strikes. At the same time, if you put, yourselves in the, put yourself in the shoes of, for example, a South Vietnamese Catholic, uh, he is facing, or she is facing, utter extinction at the hands of the communists and would be completely dependent on American America for support. Or you could use the example of uh, Afghan women under the rule of the Taliban. Uh, air power was what broke the Taliban in 2001. Air power combined with American special forces. And well, yeah, um, I think the successes in the past few years have largely been brushed over, last decade or two, have largely been brushed over because these wars are incredibly unpopular. And they are unpopular for a good reason. That doesn't mean we can ignore the places where using air power has really worked. I would argue that it's the efforts made in conjunction with air power that made them really successful, though. But you still need, I mean, you still need ground control operators to, to, to work. You still need an aspect that, that makes them successful, but at the same time, who would rather, I mean, would you rather go into a jungle <laughs> or blow up the jungle and then go to clear space? I mean, that uh, I feel like I'm I mean, trailing off in this question. <laughs> I mean, personally, I'm not a huge fan of air power just because I'm a tree hugger um, <laughs> and I like trees to live and I know exactly what happens when you bomb a large area. Uh, like the number of species that went extinct in Vietnam is astronomical and we have no idea how many actually. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's validity to, to air power and drones, but I would argue that even when you're winning one fight, you're still making enemies for the next fight. Yeah, but you know, you kill, <laughs> oh, never mind, that's a bad joke. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm um, gonna derail this right now, just so we can avoid that. But air power, air power itself is never gonna win a war. It's just not gonna happen because there is so many factors that go into modern warfare that no singular factor is going to be the decisive outcome, unless it's some brand new, fresh out the factories technologies that is entirely unmatched anywhere else. Air power is a tool. 
it's a tool like armor divisions. It's a tool like infantry divisions that needs to be utilized together in combined arms to actually achieve practical, successful effects that aren't just kind of a waste of resources and men. Sure, you can bomb a village into oblivion, but wouldn't it be better to sweep the village with infantry and, you know, not destroy an entire village? Would it be better to throw infantry against an armored battalion? No, you could just bomb them or use helicopters or something. It's applying the right tool to the right job that makes modern combat so effective. It's why our army is so diverse and why we, fo we specialize each thing. You're not going to send a fighter jet to um, take out a city. You're not going to send an infantryman to take out a tank unless he has anti-tank weapons. It's the degree of specialization that has occurred in modern military is why it's successful. Sure, you have your average Joe who can clear houses, but he's not going to, you know, take out a strategic target that needs to be eliminated with low cost of life. You know, it's... It's really just a thing of, sure, air power can do this, but it's better that it does what we need it to instead of forcing it into roles that it doesn't fit into. So are you suggesting that uh, air power has been forced into roles, that it's not being wielded properly if, as a tool? Air power as, yeah, I would say that, because, sure, devastating bombing raids do have their place somewhere it's just not in the forests of vietnam it's not in the middle east it's not in modern combat as we see it now throughout the world it hasn't been since i would say at latest korea are you saying that 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 the the modern of a i guess uh the modern use of air support is unnecessary? I wouldn't say it's unnecessary. It depends on what's being supported. Because as much as I love the A-10 as a plane, it's gotten to the point where it's obsolete. I love that plane. It's just a absolute monster. But we've gotten to the point where other planes can do the job better. It's the same with why we don't use B-52s anymore. Most of them are sitting in reserve fleets because there's no, absolutely nowhere in the world where we can level that amount of firepower. It doesn't make we sense to... Use... No, go ahead. We still use B-52s for the nuclear fleet. And, and I'm pretty sure Jack can attest that A-10s still serve their purpose. And I'm sure oh, they, they do their job. I'm not saying they aren't great weapons. It's just... They were originally anti-tank planes, and even in, when they were fielded, they were tested against tanks with thinner armor than was being fielded by the Russians. They do have their place. Well, I think, <clears throat> if I may, I think you're conflating different types of air power. Um, the A-10, since that keeps coming up, it's, it's very much a non-political tool if you compare it to the B-52. Oh, no, it's, mo it's much more localized. Yeah. Um, strategic bombing rather than bombers are, it's, it's a tool of, uh, a political tool, if you will. For example, nuclear submarines are just as much a political tool. As they are uh, both Russians and, well, pretty much every major power that has nuclear equipped submarines use it for signaling. Uh, if we see a Russian nuclear submarine off the coast of California, that's the Russians signaling that, hey, we can destroy most of California if we want to, so don't mess with us in Ukraine, for example. Well, um, I don't want to cut 